Hi, everyone. I'm Patricia Shanton, Director of Alumni Relations with the Texas Exes. Welcome and thank you for joining our July lunchtime lecture. Before we begin, it's that time of the year again where Texas Exes everywhere are gathering to send the newest Longhorns off to the 40 acres. We call them student send offs and they're always heartwarming and fun events to attend. Join your local chapter in celebrating the newest UT bound Longhorns from your area at an upcoming student send off. You can check your local chapter's event schedule at texasexus.org. And now on to our special guest today, Dr. Charlotte Channing, who is the Frank C. Irwin Jr. Centennial Professor in Drama at UT Austin. Dr. Channing received her doctorate from the University of Washington, and she is also the author of several award-winning books on theater and theater history. She is currently writing a book on the history of theater in Texas for the University of Texas Press. She is also a recipient of the Regents Outstanding Teaching Award for the University of Texas System and has served as a curator of the Harry Ransom Center. We're thrilled to have her join us here today. Please help me welcome Dr. Keening. Thank you so much uh, for that lovely introduction. Also, I, I just want to thank uh, Roxanne Garza, Patricia Shampton, Courtney Rowling, and the whole all the folks at Texas Exus. We're so fortunate at the University of Texas to have an organization like the Exus, uh, and the fact that they can keep connecting uh, faculty and, and campus resources to Exus everywhere is really, really wonderful. So I'm, I'm just really happy to be here and be with you all today. Um, today's talk is an excerpt from the prologue to my book, Making Texas Theater. If I can have the next slide, please. Uh, which is part of the University of Texas Press Texas Bookshelf series. It's really a huge honor to be included in this series and to be among the many distinguished authors. Uh, I hope you take a look at the books in the series as each of them is engaging and dynamic. They all totally deserve a place on your bookshelf. So what I wanna do with you uh, with our time together today is tell you a story. Many of you will be familiar with the larger frame of the story, the 1846 to 48 uh, Mexican-American War. And I imagine a few of you might know the details of the specific story, a production of Othello in Corpus Christi, where U.S. Grant, yes, that Grant, the general who would win the Civil War and go on to become a president, played Desdemona. Uh, at least that's how it's usually described. The truth is more complicated. Like most stories, this one has a moral and is as much a cautionary tale as it is a chronicle of improbable actions of some of the most venerable characters in US history. Um, but before I start, a small warning. One of the slides in this presentation has some virulently racist images. They're upsetting, but I hope you will not find them so disturbing that you can't continue to follow the talk. I can't really tell this story without them, uh, but I wanna mark them as offensive from before we start. May I have the next slide, please? That they were stuck in the doldrums must have come as a surprise for the army. From July to November of 1845, the small ramshackle settlement, as one person just described it, of Corpus Christi, a border city in the Republic of Texas, just before it became the 28th state, had exploded with hectic activity as close to 4,000 people descended on the area. The settlement was at the mouth of the Nueces River where it flows into Corpus Christi Bay in the Gulf of Mexico. When the army arrived, there had been 14 shabby shanties and there was now, quote, a canvas town consisting of thousands of tents. The transformation was impressive as junior officer Cadmus Marcellus Wilcox commented, quote, it was no easy matter to concentrate this army or a large portion of it, end quote. And if we can have the next slide, please. Um, companies came from Florida, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, and points west. The second dragoons arrived with a uh, train of 50 wagons and units of engineers started topographic surveys. Everything and everyone arrived through a combination of overland and sea travel. The small settlement was in no way equipped to supply the burgeoning camp, so everything had to be brought in by the army. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? <laughs> 
I'm going to be talking about a lot of different people. Some of you, some of them you haven't heard of. So I just did a cast of characters for you all to study while we're. Um, the second we're going to do, unending trains of pack mules ferried people and material from ships to the camps. The small settlement was in no way equipped to supply the burgeoning camps, so everything had to be brought in by the army. Tents were not the only buildings in the growing encampment and soldiers not the only inhabitants. As an officer, William Seton Henry described, quote, the majority of new arrivals uh, after the various regiments are grocery keepers and gamblers who have come to feed upon the army. Houses appear to have grown overnight. There are all sorts from a frame covered for want of lumber, cash or both with common domestic and domestic is a type of heavy duty canvas, common domestic to a tolerably respectable one clapboarded and shingled. Arthur Tracy, an officer from New York, noted that springing up like magic were restaurants, billiard rooms, gambling halls, and all the usual adjunct to such an establishment. Henry recorded meeting a civilian physician, uh, Dr. Hawkins, who moved to Corpus Christi because of the new army camp. With him was, quote, his amiable lady. She designs making camp her home, end quote. At least one officer brought enslaved servants with him. Many in the camp decried, as one historian's noted, quote, the prostitutes, gamblers, liquor sellers, and other camp followers who trailed behind the army. The first few months were very comfortable. George Gordon Meade, a Pennsylvanian officer, wrote home, quote, I find the climate thus far delicious. The camp is situated on a beautiful shell beach. Henry exclaimed, the scene was charming and the soft, refreshing sea, bees, sea breeze is very beautiful. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? But the weather would change and the winter of 1845-1846 was cold and wet. The, shoulder, the soldiers were sheltered in tents designed for their previous posting in Florida and provided little protection from the changeable climate of the Texas Gulf Coast. It was then the tedium set in and the novelty of being part of the town's exponential growth no longer seemed as enthralling. There was only so much training soldiers could do and there were no nearby settlements to offer acceptable distractions. Instead, drunken violence was where most of the men turned their energies. Richard H. Wilson later described the described Corpus Christi as, quote, the most murderous, thieving, gambling, cutthroat, godforsaken hole in the Lone Star State or out of it, end quote, and the men's conduct as scandalous. General Zachary Taylor, who would be president in 1849 and die in office in 1850, restricted the men to camp. Camp leadership knew then that they had to find the less, less dangerous or offensive activities to engage the troop and keep them focused on their mission. May I have the next slide, please? Lieutenant John B. Magruder was organized to, uh, was ordered to organize entertainment for the soldiers. Perhaps he was chosen, according to his biographer, Thomas Settle, be, Settles, because he was a bon vivant, nicknamed Prince John, who, quote, loved entertaining and was prone to ostentatious display. Whatever the reason, they chose well, because by November 1845, work was underway on for an 800-seat purpose, 800 purpose-built theater. There was no record of exactly where the theater was in the camp or what it looked like. One officer who was not part of the theater effort described the building as being, quote, of no inconsiderable dimensions, end quote, and 800 seats would require a substantial structure. The best known image of Camp Mabry, the bird's eye view, which you saw previously, was created in October before work on the theater uh, began. It gives you a good sense of the enormity of the camp, but doesn't indicate how the depicted buildings were used. Soldiers who were not engaged in building the theater were used to create scenery for the various planned productions. Their lack of erudition or experience made them ill-suited for the kind of theater Magruder wanted to produce, so the acting company was drawn from the officer corps. May I have the next slide, please? The theater opened its doors in January 1846 with light entertainment intended to have a broad appeal. The program was typical of the theater at the time and included a main piece, which was usually a full length comedy, a melodrama or a tragedy, and an after piece, usually a farce. Uh, 
Between the acts and the pieces would be songs, orchestral interludes, short comic sketches, novelty acts, and or dances. Next slide, please. The Army's main piece was a comedy, The Wife, A Tale of Mantua by James Sheridan Knowles. And uh, the afterpiece was James Robinson Planchet's one act, The Loan of a Lover. The local newspaper reported that every performance was sold out and audiences were enthusiastic about what they saw on stage. The wife's prologue encourages the audience. Dear patrons of the arts, if the scenes which if in the scenes which follow, you can trace what's once pleased you, cry, clap, commend it. If you like them not, your former favors cannot be forgot. Condemn them, damn them, hiss if you will. Their authors, your grateful servants still. Their rec the recommendation to be rowdy and explicit about their reactions must have been a welcome invitation to the rank and file soldiers. The tickets were not inexpensive, a dollar for the boxes and 50 cents for the pit, especially when regular soldiers made $7 a month, but they were consistent with the prices at large urban theaters. It was crucial for the theater's success that audiences feel they were getting the equivalent of what they would see in any big city. Soldiers and officers were avid theater goers and familiar with what the best of what theater had to offer. The Army theater troupe needed to be the equal of professional theater if it was going to continue to attract audiences beyond opening night. The officer producers needed these audiences not simply because their orders were to distract the troops, but also because the theater was self-supporting. The officers had to make back the money they invested and create profit if they wanted to continue producing. Meade relished his evening at the theater and recorded that the actors, quote, murder tragedy, burlesque comedy, and render farce into buffoonery in the most approved style. End quote. Henry remembered that, quote, many an otherwise dreary evening was spent by many of us with infinite pleasure within the theater's walls, end quote. Generals Worth and Twiggs, as well as Taylor, encouraged the officers to continue with the theater. The venture proved so popular that the authors, officers made a profit over what they had spent on the buildings and operations, and with their new funds, decided to expand their repertoire to include serious drama. Magruder and his collaborators resolved to produce the most popular tragedy of the day by a playwright whose works were world renowned, Othello by William Shakespeare. May I have the next slide, please? From the distance of the 21st century, Othello seems a baffling choice for the army to stage. Literary historian Kim Hall calls it Shakespeare's most agonizing play. But Shakespeare scholar Tilden G. Edelstein points out that it was the most frequently performed of all of Shakespeare's works in the 19th century. From the perspective of the pre-Civil War 19th century, it was the obvious play to include as the first serious production of the army theater troupe. Othello was a staple of Southern theaters. As Shakespeare scholar James Shapiro notes, the play was produced, quote, 20 times in Memphis and twice that often in Mobile between 1840 and 1865. In New Orleans, it was produced 37 times in 36 years, beginning in 1806. Multiple cities in the South could easily ri rival New York as a theatrical capital. Mobile and Montgomery in Alabama, Columbus and Savannah in Georgia, Charleston in South Carolina, and New Orleans in Louisiana were vibrant theater cities that attracted artists from all over the country and were popular touring destinations for theater companies from England. A typical audience member in any of those cities or surrounding areas could expect to see Othello annually, if not more often. May I have the next slide, please? The years before the Civil War, were what some scholars have called the Bronze Age of Othello, in that actors did not perform the eponymous character in blackface, but merely darkened their skin to a deep tan. Hall points out that blackness was, quote, a mark of inferiority and sin, end quote, and the choice to portray Othello in bron as bronze rather than black was a result of transatlantic slavery, which, quote, with its denigration of African peoples and racist caricatures, translated blackness 
both into both commodity and comedy, making it almost impossible to see Othello as noble and black, end quote. Uh, additionally, it was the Shakespeare play most parodied in the first half of the 19th century. And this next slide is the, the one that I um, warned you about in the beginning. Um, it was, and quote, the parody always ensured the audience of the absurdity of racial intermarriage, end quote. Par parodies did not have to change the play's original ending to convey their racist message. The murder of the blameless Desdemona confirmed in the eyes of white audiences the disastrous dangers of miscegenation and the violence of black men or the supposed violence. As theater historian Andrew Carlson points out, the character's name was often found in the crime blotter, quote, Othello was a handy so sobriquet when white Americans needed a metaphor for black criminal behavior, end quote. Whether in bronze or blackface, whether the original co play or comic parody, Othello the play and Othello the character were a set an essential vehicle for understanding and representing race. In, within the U.S. Next slide, please. Productions of Othello before the Civil War resolved the uh, question of racial equality in the minds of white audiences in favor of white supremacy. For the U.S. Army, poised on the U.S.-Mexican border, Othello reminded them why they were there and what the fight was really about. Othello may have been a soldier, just like those in the audience, but it was there that the resemblance stopped. He represented, quote, the most profound other, end quote, as Hall summarized the character's status. The U.S. Army was in Texas to establish dominance over the, those the U.S. considered other, Black, Indigenous, Mexican people in this particular situation, and ensure that their desdemonas were never defiled. The play was the ideal way to keep the troops focused on their mission, even in their leisure. Next slide, please. The first choice for the officer to play Desdemona was James Longstreet. He was rejected very quickly as too tall because at well over six feet, Longstreet towered over the officer playing Othello, Lieutenant Theodoric Porter, who would die in May 1846 at the siege of Fort Texas and for whom I cannot find an image. So the officers turned to the much shorter Grant. Next slide, please. The Grant of 1844 was not yet the enduring image of the horny veteran general of the Civil War. This Grant was 22, smooth shaven, and nicknamed Little Beauty by his fellow officers. An early 20th century biographer described him as having, quote, a girl's primness of manner and modesty of conduct. There was a broad streak of femininity in his personality, uh, end quote. And that same author attributes Grant's being almost half woman to, quote, the fact that his face was like that of a young girl's in its freshness of complexion and delicacy of outline. His voice was always soft, clear, and musical, and his hands had the long, tapering fingers of a woman." End quote. His contemporaries may have been crediting these girls, feminine, and women's qualities to Grant when they cast him. In short, everything Longstreet lacked. Having a female affect, however, was not the same as being able to act a woman on stage. Porter rejected Grant as Desdemona because, as he told Longstreet, Grant could not, quote, support the character or give any sentiment to the hero, end quote. Everyone agreed it was best to obtain the services of a professional performer to take up the role. His inability to give sentiment to the hero was a 19th century way of saying Grant could not act. Uh, the part of Desdemona isn't a great one. She has little agency and is really there only to serve the plot. And it actually demands very little from the performer. Not being able to give sentiment meant that Grant could not deliver the most important requirement of the role, which is to be a passive foil for Othello as protagonist. The decision to bring in a professional actress, one who presumably could give sentiment, was a significant one. It demonstrates that the officers took their theater seriously and wanted to create art on a professional level. 
The replacement, a Mrs. Hart, came from New Orleans, and her addition to the company was the 20th or 21st century equivalent of bringing in a Broadway star to add glamour important or importance to a regional theater production. When the Army Theater contacted the New Orleans St. Charles Theater about someone to play Desdemona, they were not hiring an unknown performer. They were hiring one whom they knew well and was familiar with and to Army audiences. Longstreet records, quote, they sent over to New Orleans and secured Mrs. Hart, who was popular with garrisons in Florida, end quote. Before the Civil War expanded railroads and made travel easier, the theater companies had two choices. Endure a punishingly difficult life on the road via river travel and horseback, or set up where there were enough people to support full houses and supplement their income with short regional tours. Cities were the obvious places for theater, but equally lucrative locations were near military garrisons. Soldiers had time on their hands, little else to spend their money on, and were loyal audience members. W.R. Hart, an actor manager from New York, took on the Apalachicola Theater in December 1840. He had previously worked in Charleston and for five years and heard about the Florida opportunity. There were not many cities in Florida in the first decades of the 19th century, but there were a lot of army camps. Next slide, please. Since 1816, under General Andrew Jackson's command of the army, and then later during his presidency, the U.S. was engaged in an ongoing effort to eradicate the Seminole peoples from Florida. The length of the war, which ran from 1816 to 1858 with a few interludes of uneasy truces, meant that there were a lot of soldiers in Florida with, for extended periods who needed distraction. Hart performed all over Florida, finally settling in the panhandle with a permanent company. He merged his group with another theater run by actor manager John Carter, then married Carter's daughter, who herself was already a, an established performer. The Florida press compared her favorably to the well-known British actress Fanny Kemble, and one critic noted he would dream, he would always dream of Mrs. Hart because she was so enchanting. The theater company in um, Apalachicola lasted four years. Hart had the misfortune to begin his theater as the economic depression of the 1840s gripped the nation. With uh, taxes high and ticket revenue low, and may I have the next slide please, Hart was forced to close his theater. And by the fall of 1844, the Hart Carters were in New Orleans and the member and members of the company of Charles Ludlow and Saul Smith at the St. Charles Theater in New Orleans. Hart's migration, first south, then west, was just one iteration of the individual lived experiences of continental national expansion that would be labeled Manifest Destiny. The term itself was born with the issue of Texas statehood. Just as General Taylor was setting up camp in Corpus Christi, may I have the next slide please? John L. O'Sullivan, a New York journalist, was transforming the nation's long held belief in continental growth into a divine mandate. Quote, Texas is now ours, her star and her stripe may already said to have taken their place in the glorious blazon of our common nationality, end quote. For Sullivan and the millions who would embrace his polemic, it was not just that Texas was rightfully part of the U.S., it was that it was God's will that the U.S. keep expanding towards, quote, the fulfillment of our manifest destiny to overspread the continent allotted by providence for the free development of our yearly multiplying millions, end quote. A heavenly endorsement carried a lot more political weight than a commercial calculation of profit. The divine mandate of manifest destiny was more than claiming land from coast to coast. As the choice to produce Othello indicated, Taylor's army knew that questions of racial superiority, whether those of the U.S., and Mexico or of slavery were why they were in the why they were in Corpus Christi. Many of the soldiers were from the south and came to Mexico filled with racial hatred. Next slide, please. White supremacy was not new to the region, um, but the Southerners and 
Anglo-Texans in the U.S. Army brought with them a ferocity and sense of entitlement that surpassed what the Strip had previously known. Meade noted that the volunteer army, quote, inspired Mexicans with a perfect horror of them, end quote. The war with Mexico was as much about racial superiority as it was about tech, uh, territory. Historian Laura E. Gomez emphasizes, quote, the idea of manifest destiny was inter inter inexorably intertwined with race and racism, end quote. The Texas fight for independence had been prompted for the most part by the Mexican abolition of slavery in 1829. U.S. Senator from Mississippi, Robert J. Walker, said of Texas independence, our kindred race predominated over that fair country and instead of the mongrel colored race and barbarous tyranny and superstitions of Mexico, superstitions of Mexico, end quote. Texas would enter the union as a slave state and that would that would be taken as evidence that manifest destiny was truly a divine mandate. The production of Othello, as you can see, with professional actress as Desdemona was a huge success. The theater had met the primary goal of raising troop morale and keeping soldiers entertained and occupied. Longstreet concluded that once the casting issue had been fixed, quote, all went well and life through the winter was gay, end quote. The theater did not have much longer to run. By the end of March 1846, two months after the triumphal opening of Othello, Taylor's army was ordered to move to what would one day be Brownsville, and Camp Marcy was abandoned. And next slide, please. Henry recorded that as the uh, army left, Corpus Christi looked perfectly deserted, the field of white canvas no longer visible, the ground looked like desolation itself, but the bright waters of the bay looked as sweetly as ever, end quote. Henry's melancholy, melancholy reflection is understandable. The area must have looked empty, especially once the army had packed up its supplies to move south, just as they had moved them to the Nueces River seven months earlier. The soldiers in the play Othello know they are on the side of right, protecting Cyprus from Turkish invasion, but many of the officers in the U.S. Army were not as confident that their cause was just. U.S. Grant later wrote, quote, I was bitterly opposed to the measure and to this day regard the war, which resulted as one of the most unjust ever waged by a stronger against a weaker nation, end quote. Even General Taylor, privately saw the situation as, quote, injudicious in policy and wicked in fact, end quote. These private doubts, however, did not hamper their public <clears throat> actions. In September 1847, may I have the next slide, please? The U.S. Army occupied Mexico City, and in February 1848, the U.S. and Mexico signed the Treaty of Guadalupe, Guadalupe Hidalgo. That treaty famously ceded all of Mexico above the Rio Grande to the U.S. Despite promises in the treaty that individual land ownership would be respected and that Mexicans now living in the U.S. would be full citizens, in the decades to come, new citizens would be defrauded of their land and subject to violent terrorism. The treaty effectively doubled the size of the U.S. and the increase in territory upset the balance of free and slave states. The transcendentalist philosopher Ralph Waldo Emerson noted in 1846, quote, the U.S. will conquer Mexico, but it will be as the man swallows the arsenic, which brings him down in turn. Mexico will poison us, end quote. The war's treaty was certainly poisonous. And historian Brian DeLay summarized, quote, Americans, America's feast upon Mexican land in 1848 helped bring about the cataclysm of the Civil War 13 years later, end quote. Through the, uh, through the twin beliefs of manifest destiny and white supremacy, the U.S. was poisoning itself. The imagery of poisoning runs through Othello. As a character, Othello is a poison. He acts quickly and his actions are deadly. As he himself says, quote, dangerous conceits are in their nature's poisons, end quote. And when Othello asks Iago to procure poison so Othello may murder Desdemona, Iago balks, quote, do it not with poison, strangle her in her bed, even the bed that she hath contaminated. 
end quote. Antebellum productions of Othello focused their racial obsessions on the eponymous character, but perhaps had they focused on Iago, audiences might have learned a different lesson. It is not Othello, after all, who is unworthy, but Iago. It is not Othello who plots to kill the innocent Desdemona, but Iago. The steady drip of white poison in the black or bronze ear causes the violence. Had the performance focused there, it is possible that the national stage of Manifest Destiny might have made Texan uh, with a very different script. Stories of theater in Texas are often like the story of Grant not playing Desdemona embroiled in politics, typical of what's happening nationally while also uniquely local, and always a showstopper, bringing the listener, listener to query whether or not they heard it right. Wait, what, Desdemona, Grant played Desdemona? You mean the griveled general of the Civil War who became president, that Grant? Grant, of course, didn't play Desdemona. He rehearsed the part and was found wanting. It was a professional imported from outside Texas who performed the role for the military audience. The excellence of Mrs. Hardis Desdemona foregrounded that in murdering her, Othello, quote, and this is from the play, like the base Indian threw a pearl away, end quote. And that line must have resonated for the audience in another way as well. Othello's description of the Indian coincided with their own. Um, except they would not be throwing the pearl of Texas away or the continent. The U.S. would retain possession of the pearl and presume itself the rightful owner. And that's the cautionary tale. How Texas became a state would incite violence and discord across the state's history. I hope my story today has affected how you think about Texas, its founding, and how the arts play a role in U.S. and Texas history. Othello ends with a vow from Desdemona's kinsman Ludovico, who promises, quote, myself will straight aboard and to the state this heavy act with heavy heart relate, end quote. Like Ludovico, I have related these heavy acts to you, and now it's up to you to decide what you want to make of them and this story. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Caney. That was wonderful. Um, we do have a couple of questions, but I just wanted to let the group know that if you have additional questions, go ahead and post them in the QA and we'll try to get to all of those. But one from Scott is a great question. So I'm just going to open with his. Um, knowing this project is a result of a lot of research, can you share any exciting moments of discovery during your research where you learned something new or were surprised by something that you learned? Well, thank you. That's a lovely question. Um, <laughs> although I have to say that for this particular incident, the the the, the my kind of memory uh, of the research was having to read a lot of army biographies and and do a lot of research to understand troop movement and how garrisons were constructed in the early 19th century, which is really far from my expertise as a theater historian. And I can't say that I, now having completed that research, find it any more interesting than I found it when I started, but it obviously was essential. I think the really the, you know, I've done a lot of research for the book. Um, it's well underway in the writing. And I think some of the things that I think on with the most sort of passion and excitement has been have been the people I've talked to um, and events I've attended uh, as part of the history or a part of the research for the book. So, for example, um, Baylor has a lovely collection of women in Texas theater, and they had a small exhibition open earlier in the spring, and I drove up there and spent a lovely afternoon with the curator in that library. Um, I've had some wonderful interactions at the Institute for Texas Cultures down in San Antonio. Of course, on our campus, we have astonishing resources, both in the Ransom Center and in the Center for uh, the Briscoe Center. Um, and also uh, uh, talking to folks at UIL has really been fun. So I think those are some of the things is that um, unlike a lot of my previous books and research, I get to sort of have fun where I live and actually get to know Texas better and people in Texas better than I have with any of my previous uh, research efforts. And that's just been a sheer pleasure and uh, will continue to be as I continue to work on the book. That's wonderful. Lots lots to 
digest there. And, and I don't know if this audience really knew how many resources are really around us, just very close. So that's cool. Um, another question from Nate is many American theater troops used heavily modified scripts. How close was the version they performed to Shakespeare's text? That's a great question. Um, it's not really clear. Unfortunately, um, pretty much all the things that I quoted and described to you is what we have of, of uh, information about this production. Um, and one of the only reasons we even know as much as we do about this production is because so many of these then junior officers went on to be very senior officers in the Civil War and wrote their memoirs or were of interest to historians, particularly at the time. So that those details got recorded. No prompt script uh, survives um, and no, uh, you know, no more information than really what I included survives. Um, it's probably, you know, the scripts were changed a lot. Othello, though, was one of the shows that we don't, there aren't a lot of uh, records of the heavily, heavily boulderized or changed versions because as they saw it, the play already made the argument they wanted to make. Um, so sure it may have been shortened or, you know, sometimes speeches were reassigned to actors they thought might do a better job with them. Um, but there doesn't seem to be any indication that they made significant changes to the script. Of course, as a historian, I need to say, as far as we know, because that's what historians always have to say, as far as we know. Of course. Um, here's, here's kind of a fun question. Was Grant upset? Do we know if he was upset after being replaced in the play? Okay, so here's what's so, so funny about this whole thing is everybody's memoirs, right? Longstreet, Mead, all those folks who wrote about their experiences make a big deal about Grant being replaced. So jump, you know, forward 40, 50 years, whatever it was, and Grant is writing his memoirs. There is not a word about the production in Grant's memoirs. He never mentions the show at all. He never mentions the Army Theater Troupe. He never mentions that he was involved. So my guess is that he didn't like being nicknamed Little Beauty and that the whole idea that he had once been uh, asked to be Desdemona was something he just wanted to forget. I, some more recent scholars have suggested that perhaps he was embarrassed because he was playing a woman, except the theater culture and performance culture at the time, it, men played women all the time and it was seen as a kind of, you know, uh, a kind of fun thing to do and it was not looked on as something you would be embarrassed to have people know that you did. Um, and, and if you saw the reasons that the Longstreet and Grant were rejected weren't, didn't have to do with men playing women, they had to do with not be good. So I have a feeling that Grant was kind of pissed off that he was that he was cut from the show, but we'll never know. Never know. OK, um, I'm going to go back to one question that I had um, and you kind of answered this, but I just want to kind of go back to this. You had mentioned in your lecture that they built this amazing theater and that there was no record of finding it. Do we have any knowledge of what happened to the theater? We don't. And, and it's really quite amazing because an 800 seat theater would be a fairly substantial building. Um, it, and, and, I mean, obviously it would have been easier to build than a theater now, right? Because you don't have electronics or ele even electricity, right? So it could be a pretty basic building. But there is, I guess it wasn't seen as that remarkable to build this enormous theater, which of course there aren't like a lot of trees in that area so they would have had to import the lumber to build the, the large theater and yet that was seen as like a totally totally reasonable activity to undertake you know i haven't given up hope that there might be something someday but it, it doesn't seem that there is and a lot of some of the officers were artists but most of them started their sketching and painting later in their careers. So I haven't yet found any other images of the camp, but that one, the bird's eye view, which is very famous. I mean, if you Google it, it shows up like 50, 50 million times. So that's the only image that I've found so far of the camp itself, let alone the theater. Is there any record of them doing something similar when they moved the army to Brownsville? No, they weren't there that long. Um, okay. By the time they got to the Rio Grande, the war was beginning in earnest. Mm -hmm. um, although there are records that after they took Mexico City and were fully occupying it, they started going to the theater all the time. So Mexican theaters were up and running. So theater resumed once they were kind of done with uh, the, the, the 
the obvious kind of warlike fighting. Right. Um, so we've got a great question here. So I'm going to kind of transition to something a little bit more serious. And you've talked about it in your lecture um, about the fact that, you know, Texas entered the uh, as a state, as a slave state, and Manifest Destiny was a very important uh, part of why this happened. Um, so EB has a great question. So I'm just going to jump into it. He's wondering with the new Texas laws precluding teaching about system, uh, excuse me, since about racism, are you nervous that the historical work that focuses on race and racism and supremacy may be censored in the future? Uh, yeah, I am. Um, yeah. I think that's a huge risk we're running as a state. Um, and I think it is a very, very blinkered view to think that if we don't tell people or talk about or think about the bad stuff that somehow we'll be stronger because the exact opposite is true. The less well we know our story, the less well we know its complications, its strengths, its weaknesses, its triumphs, its failures, the less well we'll be able to be citizens, the less well we'll be able to make positive change. I think, you know, I'm not terribly frightened as a university professor. I am fully and robustly protected by the First Amendment. And what I uh, say and teach in the classroom is, is a very protected, uh, despite what noises we may have heard uh, from other, from uh, authorities in the state. Um, but I am very concerned for my colleagues who teach in the, in the schools um, and at also at institutions that are less robustly protected than the University of Texas at Austin as a flagship. It, it operates in some ways at a national level and therefore um, has, has some kind of ways in which it's going to be able to do more things than perhaps smaller schools might be able to do. But, you know, I, I think at UT, we, we do believe in the First Amendment. We do believe uh, that speech is protected. And we very, very, very strongly believe that vigorous debate is just the backbone of education, that it's so, so important for us to think critically about everything, including the things that we hold dearest in order uh, to learn to change and so on. So while it is something I'm very concerned about and dismayed about some of the recent news and actions, I also believe that um, as a as a nation, uh, the First Amendment is one of our um, one of our treasures, and we should continue to use it robustly. Absolutely. Um, besides the few that you mentioned, were there other plays used for morale in support of Manifest Destiny, just in general? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, almost all of the westerns. You know, before there were Western movies, there were a lot of Western plays, especially in the late 19th century, that kind of romanticized and glorified what had happened, you know, with the West or the gold rush or things like that, that made it seem like it was both inevitable that these, that the U.S. reach the Pacific coast and that it needed to do that. So it was a very popular subject in various guises, you know, like this show, like producing Othello, they didn't necessarily say manifest destiny, but they were looking at works that kind of glorified and celebrated the expansion of the US. So you do get a lot of those plays and they're very popular uh, across the country. You know, they'll be on Broadway, they'll be in theaters in San Francisco and Los Angeles and so on there and everywhere. So that was a very popular subject. Okay, well, we've reached the end of our questions. Unless someone else wants to pop one in the QA real quick, I'm going to give you a, a few seconds to do that. Let's hold. Okay, it looks like we've got most of them answered. Um, Dr. Canning, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we appreciate you taking the time to speak with Texas X's all over the world. It was such a pleasure having you here and learning more about the Army's Shakespeare performance in Texas um, and those wonderful descriptions of Corpus Christi. I, I'm kind of horrified by some of those. Um, and thank you to everyone that participated in this month's event. We're finalizing the details for our August lunchtime lecture, and uh, we'll let you know when that's going to be. It will be held virtually, so stay tuned for more information and check out our website at texasx.org slash lunchtime lectures for more info. Thank you again for joining us today and y'all have a good week.